Uh, and first is Deborah Leonard from the College of American Pathologists. Well, thank you for inviting us uh, to participate in this conference. Uh, we're very excited. And um, I was a little daunted when I got this list of topics that we were supposed to cover. So um, I will try to, uh, I, I targeted my talk simply to address the questions that were asked. Um, and so we will look at the first two together, member needs assessments completed or planned and st state of genomic science and practice by members. Um, we are at, toward the end of a five-year process of um, what we call the pathology transformation process, um, which was driven by changing pathologist demographics as well as um, healthcare delivery reform and um, genomics. Uh, those were kind of the three major driving forces of this. In 2010, we did a member survey of genetic genomic knowledge, and we were rather pleased to find that, you know, 61 percent of people, pathologists, practicing pathologists, and this was a thousand of our 17,000 practicing pathologists, um, were familiar with whole genome sequencing or analysis, which we were very surprised to find. Now, we did not test them, so we don't know what they mean by familiar, but, um, uh, and then we also asked about gene panel tests and single gene tests, and of course, the um, familiarity went up. Um, so um, from 2009 to 2012, we basically defined the pathology transformation strategy which um, I think any practice subspecialty, you could um, uh, take this and just change pathology to pediatrics or medicine or whatever. Enable our members to control their professional economic destinies. Focus our support on pathology practices because classically the College of American Pathologists had been uh, focused on the individual pathologist, so it's just a technical point, and help them create greater value, especially in embedding new genomics and informatics capabilities in their work, get paid for this in the context of coordinated care. So it's a very simple strategy. <clears throat> um, and we are going to implement a multi-year um, series of initiatives starting this year and moving forward, and one of the aspects is to take the analysis that we've already done and develop a specific genomics strategy or genomic medicine strategy of what initiatives are going to have the greatest impact in helping pathologists move toward the practice of genomic medicine. So um, we were next asked to talk about the short and long-term pace of change in genomics use. So in um, pathology practice, we are currently standardly doing single or few mutation uh, or single gene or uh, pathogen detections or a few genes, but we are moving to incorporating next-gen sequencing, basically, or genomic analysis into our practices, doing predominantly gene panels or exome uh, sequencing. Right now, Research, uh, this slide may be rapidly becoming dated, but genome and transcriptome sequencing we are beginning to think about doing clinically, but pretty much remain in the realm of research, and we feel like all of the research will build back flow to help us understand the um, clinical usefulness of the sequencing that we are doing over time. So this is, this is what we call genomic analysis by next-gen sequencing. So what you need to understand about pathology or molecular pathology tests is that not all molecular pathology tests can move over into next-gen sequencing platforms. So we do a lot of tests, HIV viral loads, uh, CMV, EBV viral loads, bone marrow and Grafman analysis, those will have to stay on their current platforms and can't really be done by next-gen sequencing. But there are a lot of uh, genetic and cancer-related tests that are better done um, by next-gen sequencing, either as gene panels, and that would be for cancer or specific inherited disorders where you know the sets of genes um, used for that uh, or causative of that disease, or exome sequencing also for cancer or for unidentified inherited disorders, exome or genome. So we, in the process of doing um, this transformative strategy investigation, uh, looked at the early adopters of genome exome sequencing or gene panels, next-gen sequencing technology in clinical laboratories, and there was quite a, a rise 
in the number of laboratories doing this. And this is in 2011, just when the MySeq and Ion Torrent um, smaller instruments became available, which are really the game changer. So I will go very rapidly through this, that the first genome was done on ABI sequencers, which cost a lot of money, moving into next-gen sequencing, mostly in research, but it was an instrument that cost $750,000, and it had a one-week data processing time, I mean, data generation time. But the MySeq and Ion Torrent basically um, are in a clinically relevant price range and a clinically relevant turnaround time. So this is what is the game changer for us. Um, and we're moving on to an ion proton um, and other instruments that will have clinically relevant costs and turnaround times. So we are seeing much, much greater adoption of next-gen sequencing technologies, predominantly for gene panels um, in clinical laboratories. Um, so the current plans to address genomic literacy by the college, and I'm going to talk about different categories of initiatives. And one is assuring the quality of the genomic tests that are being performed because the college also is an accrediting body for um, clinical laboratories under, with deemed status under CLIA. Um, and so we have developed an NGS inspection checklist, series of questions that address both the wet bench aspects of generating the data as well as the bioinformatics pipeline. And it focuses predominantly on proper validation and documentation um, and applies to any instruments or tests being done by next-gen sequencing technology. And those became available in July 2012, and we are updating those this year in 2013. CAP also, um, uh, has a proficiency testing program that we offer um, to laboratories, and so we are looking at how you do proficiency testing for next-gen sequencing-based tests. We are going to use uh, highly characterized genomes, and I can go into detail about how we're characterizing those, and then each laboratory would perform their test on those a characterized genome or more sent to them, and it will assess both the sequence data generation and bioinformatics processes. We also have developed what we call resource guides, and we actually have four resource guides. There are two related to genomics. There's an, a genomic analysis resource guide and a molecular diagnosis resource guide. So some pathologists need to get up to speed with the now routine uh, molecular testing, but then there's also one for genomic analysis. And here you can see the, the table of contents, I won't read through it, of the gen genomic analysis resource guide, but there are um, uh, pearls from early adopters, there's technology information, we do it by, um, uh, we, we have information for um, different types of testing being done, standards and accreditation. Um, and in 2013, we're going to be adding a bioinformatics section to this resource guide. So many pathologists have given us very positive feedback that these are very, very useful to them. In the education realm, we had 37 molecular or genomic courses at CAP-12. I know relative to ASHG, every single one of their courses is um, <laughs> related to genetics or genomics, but this is a big change. Um, for the college. And there's a range of topics, um, some involving next-gen sequencing, but others uh, molecular testing, molecular heme path, molecular microbiology. So we have to consider the molecular and genomics of all kinds of applications, from um, inherited disorders to cancers to infectious diseases and pharmacogenetics. Um, we also have um, three pharmacogenomics online courses and other you know, we have a total of 16 online courses that pathologists can use for CME or SAMS. SAMS is what we, it's the, continu it's the continuing education for uh, reaccreditation at the 10-year period. Um, and out of the committee that I run, we also have a webinar series that's been going on for three years, um, and it focuses in three areas, genomic testing around next-gen sequencing of panels, exomes, or genomes molecular pathology testing, so, you know, not next-gen, and then organ-based molecular pathology, which predominantly focuses on cancer. And these webinars um, have reached uh, more than 4,500 CAP members, um, have attended one or more webinars, and so we're, we're having a pretty significant impact in reaching pathologists um, with the webinar series. 
And these are some of the upcoming topics, molecular microbi microbiology and community-based practice, pathologist role in breast cancer diagnosis. You can see many of them are. We always have a talk on DNA Day that is available nationally, but it's done at the College of American Pathologists headquarters in Chicago. And um, we are also providing tools for practice. Pathologists, we call these specs, don't ask how that happened, but they're um, short presentations on emerging concepts, and what they are are short PowerPoint presentations um, of five to ten slides that can be used um, to describe testing that is relevant and impacts patient care directly now. Um, and they are not branded with CAP logos or anything. They are to be used by the practicing pathologist, and we also provide key references because some practicing pathologists actually do not have easy access to PubMed, believe it or not. Um, and so they can, they can customize these for their local conferences, uh, tumor boards, um, or to talk with their hospital administrators, and we are tracking the use and we are providing updated materials. So when you download, you have to register that you are getting this, and then as we update the information, we would push out the updated information to anyone who's already downloaded um, previous versions of these. And so we have um, five of these in existence. We, our plan is to develop two more and update these, one on the workup of uh, colorectal cancer, so that's somatic mutations, um, and then inherited colorectal cancer, metastatic melanoma, BRF testing in thyroid cancer, and workup of polycythemia and thrombocytosis JAK2. Um, so what's the process for genomics practice guidelines development uh, for diagnosis and treatment? Um, we have what we call the CAP Pathology and Laboratory Quality Center. Um, to ensure that they're, so basically this is our area of the college that develops guidelines. Uh, it uses evidence to support development of practice guidelines and uh, protocols, and we usually are doing that development in the context of a multidisciplinary approach, working with either specialists from other subspecialty areas or other professional organizations. And it facilitates the coordination of consensus activities in the absence of evidence-based practice guidelines. And so this is the process. We, uh, ideas for guidelines that are needed are submitted, and so we select the ones we're going to work on. Um, and, and so we develop the scope and form the work group, do the research and uh, literature review, solicit and develop the guidelines, solicit public comments, complete recommendations, review and approve, publish and implement, and then we haven't yet quite figured out the process for maintaining. Well, actually, we do, I mean, because we have some guidelines that are out. So there are uh, two guidelines developed um, in collaboration with ASCO around breast cancer testing. We have one in press um, around the selection of lung cancer patients for EGFR and ALK tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and two more um, that are in development around acute leukemia and colorectal cancer. What you can see from this is that for pathologists, the reality is we make our money around surgical pathology practice. And so the cancer genomics is much more important and sellable to practicing pathologists than is inherited disorders that we don't have a lot of familiarity with, um, but we are trying to um, impact that. So activities by associated specialty boards to include genomics and certification processes. Our residency training program requirements currently require one to three months of training in molecular pathology, not necessarily specifying genomics. So those, area, those centers that have training programs that are incorporating next-gen sequencing and genomic testing into their molecular pathology laboratories are providing that as part of their training. Others that don't have it are not. So there aren't any specific requirements for genomics per se. The American Board of Pathology includes molecular knowledge. Um, we, we refer to it as molecular pathology knowledge. Seven to nine percent of the AP exam is based on molecular pathology and 10 to 15 percent of the CP. So that's anatomic pathology and clinical pathology. We are the only specialty that has two primary board certifications. Um, Subspecialty board certification in molecular genetic pathology is jointly by the American Board of Pathology and the American Board of Medical Genetics. That has not yet incorporated genomics into their requirements, but again, most of the 
places that have um, uh, MGP uh, fellowships are at academic medical centers. That's also where the next gen sequencing is uh, being adopted most uh, mostly. So many of the molecular genetic pathology fellows are being trained in next gen sequencing technologies. And then the college and the Association of Pathology Chairs have actually um, developed a memorandum of understanding to work together on pathology residency training issues, including genomics uh, residency education, both at the residency and the fellowship levels. And then finally, and this is my last slide, there is um, a, a Richard Haspel is at Beth Israel Deaconess, um, Harvard, and he has been leading an inter-society uh, initiative, inter-pathology inter society initiative, to um, develop a national curriculum in cancer genomics for pathology residents. Um, we called it TRIG. Actually, it's not just pathology because um, the National Society for Genetic Counselors and other organizations have also been involved in this. And so um, Rich just got an NCI R25 to support a five-year project in implementing a, a curriculum that we have already begun to develop, but we are going to um, fill it out a little bit more with three aims, is to develop the, the curriculum, evaluate that, and um, my uh, University of Vermont will be one of the four training sites where this will be uh, tried, and then promote the national implementation of this curriculum across all, uh, the goal is greater than 90% of pathology residency training programs nationwide. So I, I think I answered the questions, so. Great, thank you very much, Deborah. Yeah, that was a tour de force through the many questions that we, <laughs> that we sent you, thank you. So um, we have Mark Retain, Jean, uh, let's see, Bill, sorry, and then Mark. So Deborah, I, I appreciate the, that pharmacogenomics is one of the areas in which CAP is interested, and I yes. note on your website that you have a number of uh, uh, learning opportunities, and I'm just wondering, are you partnering with any clinical pharmacology organizations to develop these, or is this something CAP is doing on its own? Um, we have toxicology expertise and um, because we run toxicology laboratories and so I think it goes along with the pharmacokinetics testing that we do and it's growing. So it's a collaboration between toxicology, which is within pathology, but n not necessarily clinical pharmacology. Yeah, because I, I, I don't think the lab medicine types are very involved in the cutting edge work that is going on and so I would I would encourage you to, to think about working with organizations mm -hmm. such as American Society for Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics as, as one example. Well, we, we clearly are highly collaborative anyway, so that's a good suggestion. Gene? Thank you for really a nice summary, Deborah. Uh, a couple of questions. One is, in 2008, you or someone said about putting this all together and you've got a wonderful product. Can you tell us a little bit about how you did that? Painfully. <laughs> it, it really was the vision of um, the president of the College of American Pathologists at the time, as well as several of our board members who really felt like we needed a process to move pathology toward what we were then calling personalized medicine. We're now transitioning that term because personalized, personalized healthcare, personalized medicine is offensive to many um, physicians because we don't go out into the um, waiting room and say, okay, everybody with pneumonia, come into my office now. You know, it's, it's really, we personalize the care that we do now. So we, we prefer the, the term genomic medicine or precision medicine, but genomic medicine really ties it to the genomic information. But all that was happening and, and a big uproar within the college at, in 2008 because many pathologists were not incorporating genomics um, and even reticent around molecular pathology, which is the single gene testing. Genomics was kind of like the future at that point. The future is now. <laughs> so, so, there was some so, so there was some resistance to change, I guess. And yeah, but it, it became overwhelming to change. And then I, I actually chaired, um, there were four modules that did a two-year process of looking at the 
economics, the demographics of pathologists. I was doing the emergence, emerging technologies, which included um, not only genomics, but also uh, in vivo microscopy and di digital pathology, and then um, the service models for pathologists. And those four groups then um, provided information, and then that became the work of the integration team to put all that together into what we now call Pathways for Transformation. We have a document that pathologists are actually reading and embracing because it ties in with the ACO uh, changes um, and the coordinated care models of practice in that pathologists have to be out there. We can't sit in our laboratories. I mean, this is becoming really personal now. Um, sorry. But, you know, so it, it ties into a lot of different aspects of how pathology practice has to change, and genomics is just one of those. And your regulatory burden or need uh, helps you get this out to people. Of all pathologists who are practicing, how many do you, do you think you've actually gotten to with all of this educational stuff? I, well, we, um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I do know that one of my new faculty at UVM went to a leadership conference led by the college and came back drinking the Kool-Aid. And I am absolutely delighted because he's going to lead in changing pathology practice at UVM to be more the transformed model that we are looking to become. Thanks. Bill? Uh, yes, thank you. That was really an excellent presentation. I'm Bill Ochin. I'm a cardiologist who is full-time with the American College of Cardiology as a senior vice president for science and quality. And I have a question that um, I think my colleague uh, who directs our lifelong learning division would ask, but she wasn't able to be here. And it's a little bit of minutia, and that is uh, you, you mentioned that uh, 4,500 of your uh, CAP members had attended the webinars over a period of several years. Um, we think that... Um, no, that was actually just in 2011. Oh, just in 2011, oh, yeah. even even more impressive. We think that uh, that webinars are are important and uh, promising ways to provide information to our members, but have not had success uh, in in those numbers uh, ever. And so, my my question is just basically how how many members, how many CAP members are there? So I kind of like to get an idea what the denominator is. I know that there are supposedly around 17,000 practicing pathologists in the U.S., but I don't know how many okay. are CAP members. And I must say, one thing I didn't mention about those webinars, they are not CME because we can't be nimble enough and do CME. I hate to say that with the head of ACCME sitting, you know. In, <laughs> but, um, it, it's, it's very uh, hard to do that. And we also archive those webinars mm. so that you can go online. So you can go on to the CAP website and view any of those webinars over the past three years. Um, they are, they do become dated because they are on pretty hot topics usually. Yeah. Well, even, that they're not CME is even more impressive that you have those, those numbers of attendees. I think that's great. I'd like to just, uh, chat offline about sure. how, how you're so successful in that. My uh, contact information for the next seven weeks is in the bulletin, but my, <laughs> if you call that number or email me, hopefully it'll be forwarded or my assistant will say where I've located. Okay, thank located. you. Uh, Mark? Yeah, uh, it is very impressive because um, most of us have had the experience that Bill related, which we, uh, if you build it, they won't come. Uh, so uh, maybe it says something about the amount of free time the pathologists have. I don't know. Uh, so my question is a little. Educational energy yeah. that we have. Yeah, th there you, okay, <laughs> fine. Uh, yeah, well, you say tomato, I say tomato. Um, so you've obviously been tracking the use, which I think is great, and that's a very useful process metric. But I was wondering if um, there's been discussion or any efforts in terms of actually measuring the impact on practice. Have you been able to take a look and see how is this really fundamentally changing how our members are practicing? It's much harder to do, and I'm just curious if there's been discussions or attempts. Not in a systematic way. I don't know if the college has um, uh, plans to repeat the kind of survey that we did in 2010 to see if um, the kinds of things that we were asking about have changed. But um, uh, I, I showed one slide from the survey of the pathologists, but we actually did a survey of other subspecialties, patients, um, many 
other uh, people who um, don't know anything about pathologists, and it just confirmed that they don't know anything about pathologists, and we basically hide in a hole. Um, and so that's part of what we're also um, trying to I, I don't know the um, way to measure that. We have gotten verbal, I mean, email and other comments back of how individuals would incorporate this information into their practice, but not any systematic way across all of them. Great. Well, maybe while Robert Saul is, is heading up to the podium for the next um, talk, I might ask Deborah. Um, I, I noticed your uh, your meeting topics were you know legion, I think, and it looked like you had a, a very a strong emphasis, as you, as you said, thirty some seminars on on genetics. Um, I'm curious. I don't know that a lot of uh, the investigators that NHGRI supports, or even some of the other um, uh, institutes who do molecular genetic type work necessarily submit to your meeting and, and recognize that, that you know, you don't want to commit the college right now and, and or the program committee. Would there be interest in having the um, Cancer Genome Atlas or the Clinical Sequencing Exploratory Research Centers or other things that are supported in this space um, um, presenting abstracts or, or posters at your meetings? the more that um, pathologists become aware of the other initiatives going on. And, and the college does try to interact with other um, societies that are appropriate to whatever projects um, we're working on. So yes, our meetings are in September, usually. Um, and so I don't know when abstracts are due, but uh, sometime in early summer. And you can go on the CAP website and find that out, www.cap.org. It's very easy. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, Dr. Saul for the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics.